Here. Welcome to Inside Albania with me, Alice Taylor. This week, I am joined by MEP Viola von Kramen to talk about the situation for Albanians in the Presovo Valley in Serbia and the currently still ongoing European elections. I'm also going to be joined in the studio by Dr. Almud Sili, who is a hematologist, to talk about blood transfusion and blood donation. And I'm going to be speaking to a very special guest, a former colleague of mine who is doing wonderful things in Toronto, Canada. <laughs> MEP Viola von Kramen has been a regular guest on Inside Albania because she has consistently spoken up for the rights of Albanians in the Presovo Valley in southern Serbia, who, for those of you who don't know, are facing pacification by the Serbian government. This means their names have been removed illegally and systemically from the civil registry, meaning they cannot own properties, they can't um, avail themselves of health care, their children can't attend school, they can't do most things that regular citizens can do. Um, she is a co-signatory of a recent letter from European Parliament parliamentarians to the Serbian government, so I decided to invite her onto the show to find out a bit more about it. Now, Viola, thank you for making time for us um, amid this very, very busy period of campaigning ahead of the EU elections, which have already started and which are ongoing. Um, but I want to talk about something in particular, which was a letter that you are signatory to, which was sent by several members of European Parliament to the government of Serbia. Um, I've read the letter, but for those who haven't, can you give me a, a quick overview of what was in the letter and how it came to be? Well, first of all, it's not for the first time that I was approached uh, by the Albanian minority from the south of Serbia. So uh, the people who complain, uh, they don't complain for the first time, but they complain on a regular matter, and they rightly do so. Uh, so, of course, I work on Kosovo, and I see there is a constitutional right for minorities uh, in, uh, in Kosovo. But we do not have um, similar or adequate rights uh, in, uh, in Serbia. And yes, actually, we have the rights, but they are not part of the dialogue. And even more so, there were different and several agreements uh, signed by the Serbian government, but uh, there's no compliance. Mm -hmm. And so what we said in our letter is, first of all, it is of utmost importance, not just for the Euro integration, but also for the minorities in the country, especially for the Albanian minority, to stop the systematic discrimination of the Albanian minority. Um, I remember we had had a written question a couple of years ago. There was not too much of an answer uh, to uh, the European Commission. I know that the Council of Europe does uh, work on this uh, topic. And now we have approached uh, the Serbian government as such to really push them and mm. to make sure that those agreements are being um, kept uh, uphold. Do you, have you had a response? Do you expect any sort of response from the Serbian side? Well, yes, normally we do get responses. Uh, yes, normally we get uh, answers to our letters, mm -hmm. but I mean, it's very fresh. Uh, it's just not even a week ago. So here I don't expect anything so soon, uh, but hopefully uh, in, in, a, in a couple of days or weeks, uh, I hope we get a proper response. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were some um, colleagues from EPP, there's a colleague from SND who co-signed this letter, so it's not just one MEP, but it's a group of MEPs yes. who care about the minorities in Serbia, and uh, I think we uh, we deserve an answer, and the people especially in Serbia deserve an answer. And I mean, I, you and I, we've discussed this before, the fact that um, it's not part of the dialogue process with Kosovo, but I think this point has become even more acute recently when we look at what's happened with the Council of Europe and Kosovo's bid to join the Council of Europe. You know, everything seemed to point to them, them joining. I was there when the second vote took place. Um, everyone was really hopeful, really sure that in May, 
the Council of Ministers, where the Committee of Ministers were going to approve Kosovo's membership, but it was actually left off the agenda because Germany, France, some other countries as well have said, well, you know, they haven't done enough for the Serbian minority in Kosovo. They haven't established the um, Association of Serb Municipalities. Um, so this has become an even more pressing point for Kosovo. But then the Serbia are, are, and Serbia are really demanding this as well. You know, they're really digging their heels in about it. But then on the other side of the coin, they are not playing by their own rules. They're not, you know, they're not following their own agreements that they've signed. They are treating the Albanian minority badly in southern Serbia and other minorities. I believe the Bulgarian minority are, are not very happy at the moment either. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, should this not, should we be pushing for this to be a part of the dialogue? Well, yes. At that point, I think when the dialogue started, uh, there was not enough mm -hmm. political uh, power or commitment or support for including especially the Albanian minorities in South of Serbia into the dialogue. I think that would have been much easier uh, for many of us. But right now, um, I spoke to some people in, uh, in Brussels, but also in the capitals. There is no appetite uh, to have one issue, uh, one, uh, let's say, topic included. Uh, while I could imagine then the other side comes, okay, then let's include some more. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so it would be a tit for tat. But you're absolutely right, and I would like to come back to the Council of Europe decision. We should not have double standards, and we should mm -hmm. not apply double standards uh, to the countries, uh, to the member states of the uh, Council of Europe. And yes, I was also uh, in favor of... Uh, the, um, let's say, requirement, the pre-requirement for Kosovo to establish an association of Serbian uh, municipalities. That is a long-standing requirement. It is not, um, well, it, for uh, EU it's not recession. rooted from, uh, for EU accession, mm -hmm. but even more, yes, for the dialogue for everything. Mm -hmm. So Kosovo, no matter which club they want to join, that is the general rule, and actually the Kosovo government is aware of that. So this is nothing out of the sudden which pops up uh, right now. But we were speaking, since we were speaking about the application, we were also speaking about the uh, establishment of the ASM. So I think there was a failure of the Kosovo government not to submit uh, the draft statute uh, to the Constitutional Court. But coming back to our letter, I think even more so, it is absolutely crucial for the current member state uh, to uh, respect the minority rights in their constitution. Mm -hmm. Well, if we ask, as you said, if we ask this for Kosovo uh, government, we have to ask the same uh, from the Serbian government. And here, as you said, we see a systematic discrimination, we see a passivization, people are excluded from all their civil rights, they are not allowed to vote, they are not allowed to extend uh, their passports, uh, their other uh, citizens' uh, uh, rights and, and civil IDs and so on. And uh, sometimes they cannot even sell their property in the country and many more disadvantages. So I think it is time to really look a little bit closer what is actually happening in terms of minority rights in Serbia. And yes, this is a member of the Council of Europe. And yes, the same rules and the same requirements mm -hmm. should be applied also to Serbia. Yeah, I don't think it's about adding extra things into the dialogue. But like you said, it's if if Kosovo is expected to meet certain standards and implement certain measures to ensure the proper treatment of its minorities, then this should also be applied to Serbia as well. You know, it, it, I think it, without specifics, it, this uh, this approach should apply definitely to both sides. But on on the Council of Europe thing, you know, I think if they were allowed to join the Council of Europe, that automatically gives more rights, measures, protections, avenues for recourse to minority members as well. It actually would hold the Kosovo government more accountable in terms of minority rights? Well, I'm not so sure, to be honest. I think the experience in the last month uh, for uh, Serbian or 
Kosovo citizens with a Serbian ethnicity was not always positive. And I can understand that there is a level of frustration uh, which then led to the decision, uh, not in one member state, but in many member states, that since everyone is waiting for the establishing of the ASM for 10 years, for more than 10 years, that if it's not done before they entering the Council of Europe, it will be never done. Mm -hmm. And that's why, yes, on one hand, of course, um, there is a certain level of protection when you become a member of the Council of Europe. On the other side, uh, since the agreement for the dialogue and also the ORIT agreement is now part of the cluster uh, and uh, the chapter 35, I think, uh, when it comes to the EU accession, it was very important for many member states, the Quint uh, countries, the Quint ambassadors to say, but we also would like to see that Kosovo does its part mm -hmm. and Kosovo does its homework. And here, I think we have to be correct. That's why we sent the letter. That's why we said it cannot be uh, only be requested um, for the Kosovo side. The same rules has have to be applied for yes. for the Serbian side as well. I think this is really important because otherwise it looks like what's being asked of Kosovo is unreasonable, is unfair, is too much, you know. But if if Serbia is held to the same levels, to the same standards, then it becomes fairer, you know, for Kosovo to look at implementing these, these things no, that may be absolutely. hard to swallow, that may not go down well politically. But if they can say, well, Serbia are now being told to do the same thing and are now doing the same thing, then it becomes easier for everybody to bear, I think. No, absolutely, absolutely. And, and uh, I think that there is uh, also a certain level of skepticism whether Serbia is treated in the same way as all the other countries, because, of course, one may suspect that, yeah, Serbia, we were not uh, talking the same tough language, we are not putting mm -hmm. any measures, we are not applying uh, any other restrictions. Uh, it's mainly because of the size, because of the political uh, weight of, of whatsoever. Uh, but I think we should not make any difference. On the contrary, mm -hmm. we know how Vucic uh, rules the country. We know how close he is to Xi Jinping. Uh, we know how much he makes out of this partnership uh, with Dodik and with uh, Putin and so on. And that is a political or security threat. And here, I think, uh, domestically, we should be very clear. Now we saw the massive fraud during the election. And yes. also here, I hope, when we are re-elected um, after the 9th of June, that we will have a good group in the European Parliament to monitor this, to watch this, and to make sure there is a European way and there is a European path for Serbia, but not just an accession path. And this brings me on to the next um, part of the interview, which is to do with the outcomes of the European elections. Um, we are seeing that the right is making gains in quite a few countries. The, the makeup of the European Parliament is set to shift. Um, who is going to be the Commission president? We're not quite sure who that's going to be yet. Who's going to get the top jobs as commissioners? You know particularly the Commissioner for Neighbourhood and Enlargement um, and other key roles sort of under those umbrellas, you know. And I, I want to understand from your view, what are your concerns, what are your thoughts, your projections in terms of the outcome of the elections and what impact this could have on a session, but also, as you mentioned, Serbia, Kosovo and security? Well, I mean, the polls do not look too good for the progressive parts, but you can always be caught by surprise. So let's wait and see what really happened on the 9th of June. And the second point is you see that on the right wing side, they are so much divided, that might be also an advantage then for the other side, for the democratic side, for the centrist, for the liberals, for the progressive. If we get united, we are still much stronger. We have a broad majority. Uh, amongst us or between us. So here I think it needs a clear commitment 
regarding foreign and security policy, uh, making sure uh, that on the very important points such as accession, such as increasing the capacities for military and defense, mm -hmm. we need to stay united. We need to make sure that Putin has no chance to destabilize our uh, societies. When it comes to the next commissioner on enlargement, we should not allow to repeat the mistakes which Ursula von der Leyen has done last time. Such an important, such a significant file. She speaks about geopolitical commission and then she gives a file which is absolutely crucial for our security, for our development, for our uh, direction, mm -hmm. for our, yeah, for, for the future. She gives it to an Hungarian commissioner who has nothing else to do than to collect as many autocrats to bring into the European Union than instead of developing uh, the candidate countries, instead of mm -hmm. setting up a clear red line and making sure the, there is a condition, yeah, the money is conditioned uh, with, uh, with clear criteria, clear benchmarks, and this we missed during the last five years. So my humble opinion is that file, that portfolio is too important to give it to an autocratic representative. Yes. Uh, no friends of uh, dictators uh, should be allowed to decide on this important um, file or this uh, development. But we are not even sure whether Madame von der Leyen will be re-elected. Mm -hmm. um, I think she actually did a good job. Um, and also I can imagine if she does not dance with the right wings if she makes clear that she takes all the democratic forces on board but no uh, post-fascist, neo-fascist, right wings, Putin lovers. I think it would be also from our green side yeah. uh, to uh, so sig uh, signal our support. But uh, she wasn't clear. No, she did no. not say that she will she exclude um, mm -hmm. Meloni and others. Yes. And that makes it uh, super difficult for us at the moment to mm -hmm. pledge whether we will be on board in this coalition or not. Yeah, I think there's been definitely a, a flirtation with the right and the far right as well. You know, she hasn't explicitly ruled it out. Other members, other key figures have not ruled it out. You know, they've said they have their red lines, one of which is being pro-Ukraine, you know, but this I don't think is enough really um, to safeguard from, no. you know, the, the negative impacts and fallout from siding with right and far right you know, neo-fascist groups. Um, I don't think this is enough. Um, so I am hopeful like you um, <laughs> that we will have some surprises that differ from the polls that we're seeing at the moment. Um, Viola, I wish you good luck with your campaigning, with the results and um, with what happens next. It's going to be an interesting few months for Europe and also for people in the region who are watching very intensely. Thank you so much and thanks for having me and hope to see you soon yes. again. Thank it's you. a pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye. Next up, another inspiring story of an Albanian who has left the country and is doing wonderful things abroad. I used to work with Stevie Janka at an online media in Albania. He joined us as a sort of intern, um, and I always knew he was going to be destined for great things. I was really happy when I saw a recent Instagram post of his showing that he's been doing extremely well in Canada with his studies and now his future career. So I decided to invite him on the show to find out a bit more about what he's been up to. Stevie, it's been several years, but it's a pleasure to speak to you again. Welcome. Hi, uh, hi Alice. It's good to see you again. It's a pleasure as well. Now, first of all, you have been studying in Canada. Um, but for our audience, can you explain exactly where, what you've been studying, why you left Albania? Fill, fill us in on the last few years. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I landed here three years ago. It's been, it's been a pretty eventful journey. Um, I came here to continue my studies at Dalhousie University, which is one of the top 10 universities in Canada. I um, you know, pursued a degree in economics with double minors in mathematics and uh, finance. 
And I recently graduated from Dalhousie. Uh, the convocation was uh, a couple days ago. Mm -hmm. And right now I'm in the process of uh, um, getting ready to start my work at uh, KPMG Canada under the technology consulting practice. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the reason why I left Canada was uh, obviously to seek for more opportunities. I'm someone who has very big ambitions in life. So I believe that those ambitions were not being offered in my country mm -hmm. at, the, at the moment. So that's why I came over here. Why Canada? Out, uh, why not the US or the UK or somewhere else in Europe? Why Canada? Well, um, the main reason is obviously uh, financing. Uh, compared to uh, America, Canada is much more affordable and much more friendly to international students. So that was mm -hmm. the main reason I came to Canada. In terms of North America, um, why specifically North America? It has to do with the fact that there's you know, significant business opportunities here, significant funding for people who want to create their own company one day. So that's basically it. And you didn't just graduate, did you? You didn't just pass. You didn't just get a good grade. You did exceptionally well, didn't you, Stevie? Oh, thank you. Uh, that is correct. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now is your I, moment to show just, off. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> well, um, at the end of every year, my alma mater um, recognizes students that with the highest GPA of uh, their faculty. And this year, the student with the highest GPA from the Faculty of Economic, uh, Economics was me. Mm -hmm. And I received the University Medal in Economics uh, during the convocation ceremony. Now... GPA, for those who don't know, can you just explain a bit about what this means um, in terms of your results and also how many other students you sort of beat, <laughs> so to speak? Right. Well, GPA uh, stands for your grain point average. Um, it's a measure of, you know, uh, your academic performance during your studies. And yeah, uh, basically my GPA was 4.27 out of 4.3. Um, and uh, yeah, I beat, I think, around 150 students from the faculty, this year's faculty um, graduating class. Wow. So one of the best universities in Canada in one of the hardest subjects, and you came top of the class, basically. Well, I guess that's a pretty <laughs> correct yeah, description. It's true, it's true. And this medal is just for the GPA average or it takes into account other aspects of your academic performance and your attendance, your attitude, or, or it's strictly just for the GPA? Uh, the medal is just for the GPA. There are other um, certifications and um, awards that I have received for, for example, my honors thesis, an honor, um, which was the, the best as well from the graduating class of 2024. Well done. Very, very well done there. Now, what are you, you up to now and what is next? You mentioned you're going to be working with KPMG, which is one of the world's biggest consulting companies. But what else are you up to at the moment? Uh, well, right now, in a way, I have a finger in every pie, so to say, because I, on the one hand, I am working on uh, developing a programming language that is similar to RStudio, uh, but... Um, has a simpler user interface and basically uses AI to facilitate programming. Uh, that's still in the works. It will take a while, but that's something that I'm doing in my spare time. I'm also working on developing uh, business uh, management software for uh, small to medium enterprises in Southeast Asia that we, we expect to go live in about a year or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm also working with uh, my uh, an NGO that I co-founded with a friend of mine, Arbor, from MIT about a year ago now, uh, called Albanian Trailblazers. We are an NGO that helps students in Albania uh, to connect with uh, other successful Albanians abroad mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, receive uh, mentorship and uh, guidance in their journey. Uh, whether that's academic or professional. And we also organize different training workshops to better prepare young Albanians for you know, the workforce. And yeah, I, uh, I, it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity, in my opinion, for uh, young Albanians right now, because I wish I had a similar opportunity when I was in high school or mm -hmm. when I just got started in university. So for anyone watching, I kindly invite them to check us out. So they can connect with you through the, this NGO and receive guidance, advice, support, you know, tips um, from people who've 
already been through this process of leaving Albania to study abroad or are setting up their own businesses or working for big companies. It's like knowledge sharing and support and guidance. Precisely. Um, you know, during my years here, I've realized that the Albanian community in North America is unbelievably supporting. And we decided that it would be, you know, a, a great opportunity to use that amount of support for people that people have with each other here to people that are in Albania. And we have people in our mentorship team that are studying in Ivy League universities, whether that's MIT, uh, Cambridge, um, Oxford, and many other institutions. So it's an amazing opportunity. So it's top universities that, around the world. It's not just North America focused. Uh, that is correct. Our mentors mm -hmm. come from all walks of life. We also have people that are studying in Germany, people that are studying in Italy, Great. not necessarily just North America. It's like a, a network. Yes, brilliant. This is really good. Um, I have a couple of questions for you as well. I know lots of people who live in, in Canada. Um, what do you like about it? What don't you like? There has to be some things that you think, well, it's better in Albania. It can't all be, you know, the grass is greener on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of things that I like, um, it basically boils, boils down to the fact that here there are much, many more um, academic opportunities, business opportunities for people who, you know, want to make something of themselves like me. Um, and that's the main advantage, in my opinion. Um, but in terms of disadvantages, um, especially in Toronto, where, where I live, uh, it's a pretty intense place. <laughs> Uh, it's like, you know, the New York of Canada, uh, every, very bustling city, everybody trying to make it big. Sometimes it's a little dangerous, so it can get pretty intimidating. Um, and, you know, compared to Albania, uh, Canada does not really offer me that peace of mind that I have when I have there. Uh, you know, it's, I come from a small town, Permet, in mm -hmm. southern Albania, which is, uh, it's, it's gorgeous uh, and it has very fresh air and gives me a peace of mind like I've never had before and I've been around. So yeah, uh, uh, Canada just cannot offer that to you. And the food is also nowhere near <laughs> as the food in Albania. <laughs> Unless it's an Albanian <laughs> restaurant. Well, yeah, I guess. <laughs> um, do you think you'll ever come back to Albania? Um, I believe so. Um, mm -hmm. I believe that my generation, probably more than any other uh, generation, has a significant responsibility to give back and lay some healthy foundations for the future of the country. Um, in my opinion, we are still a very young democracy. We're still in transition, mm -hmm. even though it has been many decades since communism fell. And yes, the situation right now is grim. Yes, there's commun th yes, there's uh, um, corruption. Yes, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, things going under the table, but that does not mean that, you know, we should give up on, on Albania. Uh, on the contrary, that means that we should work harder uh, to, you know, yes. to give back. And from a personal perspective, I believe that in the near future, I will probably be giving back uh, as a businessman, but maybe in the future, I might consider politics, but only time will tell. We have had a conversation about this several years ago. I think I said you could probably run for prime minister one day. Um, Stevie, thank, thank you. you so much. I'm proud to know you. I'm really happy to see you have gone on to achieve great things and you are being successful and proactive and you're involved in all these great initiatives. And I'm looking forward to seeing what you do next and also hoping that you come back at some point and share this knowledge and, and help sort of plug some of the gaps, fix some of the issues that are going on in this country. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, Alice. All the, All best. the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'm joined in the studio today by Dr. Al Sili, who is a hematologist at Nena Teresa University Hospital. A hematologist, for those who don't know, is someone who specializes in blood. Alma, welcome to the show. Um, Thanks, first, Alice. before we get into all of the, the topics we want to discuss, can you introduce yourself? Absolutely. Uh, what exactly is it you do? What's a day in your life like? Okay, I'm a hematologist at the University Hospital Center Mother Teresa, the hematology clinic. I've been there since 2008. 
uh, for one year and a half I was a volunteer and in our clinic we treat cancer daily. We are a unique center in Albania, so there are a lot of patients, a lot of work. So my day from 8 a.m. till 2 p.m., which are our official hours, is quite full. And what do you do during that time as a, as a hematologist? As a hematologist, okay, we do rounds on patients. So there are a lot of patients, or I would say like 98% of our patients need chemotherapy. So we do mm -hmm. write prescriptions for protocols. Uh, we take vital signs. And of course, we uh, ask for, uh, you know, there are certain patients that need blood transfusions. There are some of them that need platelet transfusions, which we call supportive therapy. So, but mostly we are there for the patient all day if they need us and mm -hmm. stuff like that. It's not just us, it's our our lovely residents, our lovely nurses that do a great job every day. So as a hematologist, people who, what conditions impact sort of the blood and require transfusions or treatment, platelets, okay. plasma, etc.? There are a lot of cancers, hematological cancers, that need uh, blood products or uh, blood transfusions. But of course, there are uh, th uh, there are certain anemias that are uh, hereditary, like mm -hmm. cycle cell disease or thalassemias that need blood transfusions, and they need it if they are uh, like uh, uh, they need uh, if they are the major form. Let's say thalassemias, they need it like every 21 days, and right. some of them even sooner than that. So there uh, there are a lot of solid cancers in other clinics as well, you know. But in our clinic, it's mostly hematological cancers that need blood transfusions or uh, uh, platelet transfusions mm -hmm. and, and uh, stuff like that. So hematological cancer is like leukemia? Yeah, like, like leukemias and lymphomas and chronic leukemias, acute leukemias especially. We need a lot of blood transfusions on them mm -hmm. because of, uh, you know, the conditions they are and it's, a, it's an acute form yes. and people need support, so. How many patients are you treating with these chronic diseases? Mm -hmm. So the, the various diseases you've mentioned, people who require regular treatment. Okay, uh, well, I can't give you a certain number. I can only tell you that like in a day in our clinic, there are about 80 patients and yeah. that does include our ambulatory clinic. Uh, so we have a uh, part of them are hospitalized. Acute leukemias are uh, in general hospitalized because they need mm -hmm. a lot of care. But there are a lot of uh, cancer patients like uh, chronic uh, cancers, like let's say lymphoma, chronic lymphocytic leukemias, that they come to our clinic every like three or four weeks and they do the chemotherapy protocol and they can go back to their homes because their conditions are quite well. Yeah, they, they don't need inpatient. Even no, they, they don't need inpatient. Mm. Sometimes they do if they develop like certain infections or, uh, but mostly they are, they are treated in our ambulatory clinic. Mm -hmm. It sounds, I mean, it must be quite tough work working with people who have these very serious yes, chronic conditions, which, and yeah. even aside from the condition itself, um, mm -hmm. I have people in the past who I've known who've had leukemia, um, yeah. very young, um, yes. in fact, and it's very difficult disease, but not just that, but the treatment. So the chemotherapy mm -hmm. yeah. has its own range of side effects as of well. Course. This must be quite difficult work for you, seeing the impact it has on people dealing with families who are emotional, who are scared. Yeah, yeah. we do the psychologists, we do the doctors, sometimes we have to do the nurses, we do the friends and yes. everything. The so. shoulder to cry on. Yes, yes. yes. We, uh -huh. we, are, we are just there for our patients. Mm. Daily, so. Now I want to talk about blood transfusion. Um, mm -hmm. I'm from the UK and I've lived in Europe for in the EU for mm -hmm. 10 years and I was never allowed to donate blood in the EU because as a British, someone uh -huh. who was in the UK um, during a certain time when we had um, BSE, it was a, it was a, a disease, a blood disease mm -hmm. in cows. And anyone who's thought to have eaten meat during this period is not allowed to donate blood in the EU. Oh, okay, so I, I was never allowed to donate blood. And I always wanted to because I had the universal blood group. So it's useful to people, you know. Uh -huh. um, but in Albania, they accept my blood. I don't have this condition. Yeah. But because I was born during this period, I... They, they don't were just let me scared to, to yeah. take your blood. But I, I don't have it. And in Albania, they let me donate my blood. So I go twice That's a great. year. That's I'd, wonderful. I'd go more if they let me, but they said I'm not allowed to. Yeah. So twice a year is, is how often I go. And That's when I wonderful. say this to people, sometimes they're a bit surprised. Even the people in the blood donation clinic are a bit like, they're mm. like, who are you here for? I'm like, no, I'm just, <laughs> uh -huh. I'm just here to donate. And it's... It's a different culture, I think, to mm -hmm. perhaps the UK and other countries in Europe where people 
often voluntarily go and donate regularly. It's just something you do. Mm -hmm. um, here, it doesn't seem to be quite so popular in that respect. Is that correct? Yeah, you are, you are correct. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate you. It's a great act. I mean, your blood serves to a lot of people and it's the most performed procedure, as we mentioned earlier, in the hospitals. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a lot of conditions that need, uh, like from accidents to solid cancers or uh, uh, hematological cancers or chronic anemias or acute anemias, like blood loss from the GI tract and all that. But yeah, it is not very popular that Albanians go and donate blood. Actually, I want to... I want to make a call. Everyone can donate blood mm -hmm. every three months. Of course, that blood is tested for a lot of infections like hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV, and of course, syphilis. Uh, there are a lot of uh, conditions that can't donate blood, but there are certainly a lot of people out there who can donate blood. Mm -hmm. In Albania, there are about 13 people in 1,000 inhabitants that donate. The aim is to make the number 20, so we don't have to have family donators. Mm -hmm. Let's say you need a surgery, your family members have to go, it's mandatory and donate blood, but let's make that number like volunteers totally. Yes. There are a lot of institutions who do it, like public institutions, I want to you know, congratulate them, it's a great act. But there are a lot of people out there that are kind of scared to donate blood. Nothing happens to you. The mentality, there's this yeah, is know, also know. conspiracy sort of, oh, they're mm. going to sell the blood on the black market or it won't go to the person it's supposed yeah, to. Yeah. What do you say to these people? Okay, no, no, let's just, I mean, uh, let's just not think about this. That your blood goes directly to the, to the central blood bank, which is uh, in uh, La Praca area by mm -hmm. the... Uh, by the hospital there, but it gets tested and all that, and with uh, the, all the tests, you know, it, it does. Uh, they do get the ABO group as well, yep. and it goes to the to the to the persons yes. that need it for and sure. And everything had serial numbers yes, and codes, definitely. and it's yeah, all yeah, recorded. Yeah, yeah. So um, it and is actually, definitely recorded. I you then get uh, a full blood work afterwards yes, you get yes. to know i mean i don't know what it means but i send it to my doctor and he says very good yeah um so this is part of it as well when you donate you get something back absolutely as well. you get tested for these conditions as i as i mentioned hiv hepatitis b and c and syphilis and if you would get tested somewhere in a private clinic you'd pay for it yeah so why don't you just donate blood yes. and get tested for but free it gives you the general blood workout absolutely. as well so you know if you're in general good health and everything not just yeah. for diseases so um, this is because I want to appeal to expats, foreigners, mm -hmm. immigrants who are living here to go yeah. and do it as well. I, I did a campaign about four years ago now with the, pres the president at the time, mm -hmm. Ilya Mehta. We brought expats from Durez, Saranda and Tirana to donate blood. And we had lots of them all donating blood. But I want to encourage them to go back again yeah, as well. Yeah. So um, basically from you again, mm -hmm. can you just reassure people that it doesn't hurt? There's nothing to worry about. It's the blood goes to those it, who need it yeah it's just a little prick it just hurts just a bit as if you were doing some you know blood work general blood work or general testing so and then of course uh, i would i would make a call to all the public institutions mm. they are the ones actually that regularly donate blood the uh, the central uh, blood bank they do have they do go in different institutions and they collect blood which is a great act but you save lives with that blood you have to think yes. one day i mean god forbid we may need that blood and uh, th there is another condition which is called autologous uh, blood transfusion which means you donate the blood and then in the future you can use it i mean just in case god forbid you need it so mm -hmm. uh, but it's usually allogenic so there's a different person out there that gets tested and then you get your uh, the same exact blood and same exact resus group but Everyone can donate, mm -hmm. everyone can save lives. It's just one of those beautiful things that anyone can do in life. It's such a small act. Yes, to do, and, it, and, it? and it, it, it doesn't take a long time, as you no. mentioned, like just 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Anyone can do that. And are there side effects? Uh, no, you may feel a little bit dizzy afterwards. We encourage them to take a lot of fluids and mm -hmm. uh, all that, and maybe. Let's say people that uh, you know are into sport and all that, they can just postpone it for a few days, but yes. uh, nothing, nothing this, special. And I was told, don't drink alcohol afterwards yes, as yes, well. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, because don't it does dilate it. your yeah. blood vessels and yes. can lower your blood yeah. pressure. Where can people donate? Is it just the at Nena Teresa Hospital or it, are there it, other? 
It's at yeah, it's at the Mother Teresa University Hospital at the blood bank we have mm -hmm. there. Or people can go in any blood bank in all the uh, regional hospitals. Mm -hmm. Or a lot of people donate at the Central Blood Bank, which is in uh, La Braca. Uh, so anyone anyone can donate. Anyone, uh, any 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 age, any adult can do that. Mm -hmm. So, so as long anyone over eighteen. Anyone over eighteen. Anyone who uh, like knows that they don't have like infectious disease that. Let's say they are carriers of hepatitis or HIV, mm -hmm. but at the end they still get tested. Yes. I mean, but if you know that you are a carrier, you cannot go and donate because no, no. that blood will be thrown away. Yes. They can't use it if you are if you have, let's say, hepatitis or uh, B or C or HIV or syphilis. Mm -hmm. That that blood will go nowhere, so you don't really yes. need to donate it. And also, if you're anemic, you can't uh -huh. or you have low no, blood. No, you iron. can't. Mm -hmm. No, you can't donate blood if you are anemic. I want to. Just talk again, because uh, I think it's important, just another mm -hmm. sort of question about the stigma around donating blood mm -hmm. and for people to understand exactly how much difference their packets of blood can make for somebody. Oh, Spell it a out. huge difference. Let's, let's, let's imagine someone who had like an accident and they had a lot of blood loss and they need blood immediately. You can save lives, trust mm -hmm. me. Because sometimes them shelves get empty because the donators, especially during COVID times, people would not go out and people, you know, the level of donations really dropped. Mm -hmm. But nowadays we are improving, but we are not still at the level. As I talked to the people of the blood bank, we are not where we are supposed to be. So uh, public institutions are the ones that make a huge difference, except general people. What is the level of blood at the at the mm -hmm. in Albania you know that we have in stock um okay. how high should it be I mean how short are you running uh, well, uh, we can we can fulfill the need in our clinic. Sometimes uh, we have we tell the patients, uh, the patients, family members to go and donate. Sometimes we have students who are offered as soon as they listen in the clinic that this patient needs blood or it's a rare type, like like let's say A B rhesus negative is mm -hmm. quite rare. They just go and donate. So um, I can't tell you exactly if they are short. I just know that the numbers are where not I'm they not, are supposed to. Yeah. Like from 13 in 1,000, they should be like 20 in 1000. Mm. Thank you so much and thank you for the good work that you do. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> it's been a real pleasure. That's all for this week. Don't forget you can watch Inside Albania on our YouTube channel Euronews Albania. You can listen to us across all major podcasting platforms and we are on every Saturday at five o'clock on Euronews Albania and Sunday morning around nine o'clock. Until next week, Mira Pavsin. <laughs>